very much, Miles. I remember when you did get to Singapore, I think you were also very much taken with the fact that I'd managed to replenish the glassware with some really nice uh, Waterford crystal, um, which we were trying to economise in the department at that stage, but I managed to get a cheap deal on that. So I think you were also very much taken with that. Um, thanks wife, for the intro. My wife is nodding. <laughs> <laughs> and the silver, of course. I had the silver redone as well. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, Marcel, the Swiss ambassador here tonight, it's always <coughs> nice to be in the presence of an ex excellency. As an ex-ex, it's probably the, um, the one thing I miss about New York, I think, is the title excellency. You do get used to it after six years. <laughs> anyway, let's hope for the future. Uh, the thing you didn't, uh, you didn't mention, Miles, is my singular success in my career on my first posting in Ireland which was many years ago uh, when I was named the Irish Country Women's Association Man of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> the less said the better, but uh, when I went back many years later and I was walking around uh, uh, the main square where they have their headquarters, I thought, yes, yeah, about, I don't know, 20 years later, I wandered in and reintroduced myself, but didn't have quite the same impact, I have to say. <laughs> they didn't particularly want to remember. Anyway, tonight's uh, talk, I, I've called it, it really will be a conversation, uh, term on the Security Council, was it worth it? Now, I don't know if any of you have had time to read the Lowy Institute's um, annual polling report, which it published today, Australian attitudes towards uh, different countries, different aspects of our foreign policy, different issues. Uh, they published that today, and their section on the UN, they've had for the last five or six years, one of the questions they've asked people is about the United Nations and specifically about the Security Council. They title their question, Was It Worth It? Uh, they group the Security Council and the G20 together, which I think is why we only achieve 62% strong, strong support from Australians who've already voted um, that it was worth it, both memberships of both organisations. It's an interesting figure because they started doing this about, um, let me see, they've been polling for 11 years, they started doing this about seven years ago. At that time, they were asking Australians, should we be a candidate for the Security Council? What do you think about that? Um, and over 50%, it was usually 56, 57%, each year said very strongly, yes. Another 20% said strongly, yes. Only 6%, one or two years, only 5% said no. The rest just didn't know. That figure basically never varied. That's a very strong expression from Australians, those Australians who were polled, first of all about support for the UN as a whole, but specifically for support for the Security Council. This is the 70th year of anniversary year of the UN, of the UN Charter. <coughs> um, we don't need to go through the history of the UN, but I might just say one or two quick things about it. Uh, the UN does often get a bad press, as you know, um, but uh, what I'd say to the bad press is, so what? I mean, what are you expecting? I mean, <laughs> this is an imperfect organisation. It's the second time only that humanity has tried to institutionalise, to structure a way of dealing with peace and security. The first time failed, the League of Nations. The second time, well, we're still doing it. Um, there is no alternative. As Dag Hammarskjöld said to the critics, you've got to remember the UN wasn't created to take us to heaven. It was created to save us from hell. It was born out of the 40 most violent years in human history uh, with 100 million dead. So we should always remind ourselves, I think, of that as the touchstone for why the UN exists. Uh, it has unique legitimacy, unparalleled. It has unique convening power. It can convene summits of all world leaders and they'll turn up. Not all of them, but uh, most of them uh, will turn up. It has a unique mandate. So all of that um, to an audience like this, I think, is is glaringly obvious. We should always remind ourselves about it. We should also remind ourselves that 40% of the world's children are immunised through the UN. There are 130 million people every day who are fed by the UN. We have the largest number of displaced people and refugees at any time since the Second World War at the moment. And who, who are these people um, being looked after? Uh, in many, many instances through the UN and through the activities of UNHCR and others. I should comment, by the way, the average uh, period for someone who is a refugee in one of these camps has gone up in the last few years from 17 years to almost 20 years. That's how long they spend in these camps. 
uh, who's going to do this um, uh, if the UN doesn't take one of the, the key elements of all of that. And I can go through all the functional agencies and say the advantages they deliver to the world. There's also the, uh, the creation of law, the setting of norms and standards to, to create a floor to hopefully even better practice by member states. That's all done through international instruments, of course, but it's the United Nations. It's the foundation in which uh, we continue to operate with each other. There's a lot more competition out there these days to the UN. We have a private sector. We have many, many, many more regional organizations in existence um, than uh, from the time when the UN was created, although the Charter has a chapter, Chapter 8, which is all about cooperating with regional organizations, one of the more prescient aspects of the Charter. And we have uh, just generally a growth as well in um, civil society. So we have a lot more contestability out there in the international um, sphere to do things that the UN has also been required to do in the past. But that makes for a better system, more buy into the system and more potential to actually be able to make change. Uh, but with the UN as one of the drivers in that as well. So. You know, frankly, I think when the question about the UN comes up, um, you just have to say, well, yes, it's probably needed even more today than it was in the past. You have a world in which power is more dispersed, international authority and law is challenged, the nation state is less sovereign, action is more contested and ideas more contestable. You put all of that uh, into an equation, I think the need for the UN is greater. Now, I tend to talk for too long, so you must uh, stop me when you need to. Um, I should say the Security Council, of course, is at the apex of the UN system. It's an executive body. We sat there taking decisions every day. We met every day. Um, in fact, it's meeting more times than ever in human history, 271 meetings last year of a formal kind, about another 12 or 13 or 1,400 um, uh, informal meetings of one kind or another. It's an executive body, it really takes decisions, and the decisions are on peace and security. It's the only international body legally mandated to uh, authorise the use of force. It's got the power to create law, uh, that's important, and to impose obligations on states. UN resolutions are, obliga are ob obligations for all member states, particularly things like the sanctions regimes targeted against a number of uh, individuals, not against countries, by the way. They haven't done that for, for 20 years. They're now targeted much more uh, surgically against individuals or entities um, who uh, are the basis of those regimes. More sanctions regimes, 15 now uh, than uh, ever before. Two more created last year, the Central African Republic and Yemen. Um, it creates tribunals, international legal tribunals, to hold people uh, to account. Uh, and, of course, it can refer crimes to the International Criminal Court. We need to do more from the UN system to support the ICC, of course. And it does create and consolidate existing norms. <coughs> so it's a terribly important organisation. Uh, when we were last on, um, apart from the last two years, that was 27 years ago, 1985 to 1986, um, it was a very different body. You had the Cold War. You had the Security Council basically stalemated because of the Cold War, the exercise of the veto power. Um, and uh, it uh, met on average once every two weeks because it had to, was obliged to, sometimes though very brief meetings. Uh, and it only had four peacekeeping missions, 2,500 peacekeepers, and they were in fact just observing um, uh, peace lines, um, demarcations, armistices, they were not out there actually actively trying to create peace. The world in which um, the Security Council now deals, and us as a member of the Council, of course, is vastly different than uh, it was then. Uh, conflict is now not between states, there are one or two exceptions, but mainly internal, civil war, ethnic, tribal, religious. Uh, we have 16 peacekeeping missions in the world. Um, which is um, with about 130,000 uniformed peacekeepers, 125, 130,000. In addition to that, another 12 or 14 what are called political missions, which are about trying to develop societies which are coming out of conflict, you know, to create the institutions and security circumstances and employment opportunities. You've got to get the boys off the streets or they go back into the militias. So that's a, a big task for the special political missions and peacekeeping. Um, it meets uh, and reviews the mandates for those pe peacekeeping missions at least once a year, often twice, often three, four times. 
um, and all up the council does actually review situations in about 40 countries every year. About 70% of the work is on Africa and that's where so much of the conflict uh, is happening. Over 80% of peacekeepers uh, work uh, in Africa and this is some of the most difficult environments of course imaginable and of course where there's no alternative where no one else wants to go, let's be frank about it. I mean, the French went into Central African Republic to stabilise because there was no choice um, and, of course, and did a superb job, and they did in Mali as well. But, of course, countries want to then get out as quickly as they can, can and transition to a, a peacekeeping operation through the UN. A couple of other things I'd say is the nature of combat, uh, the nature of conflict, I should say. Apart from it being internal, there are a couple of other things. Uh, it's more violent in many cases that it's been for a long time. Civilians are deliberately targeted as a, a, a technique of war now, far more than in the past. If you're a civilian, you're eight times more likely to be killed in a conflict situation than if you're a combatant. Eight times more likely to be killed than a combatant. And of course, humanitarian workers and peacekeepers are now deliberately targeted as an act of war as well. Obviously, in the case of peacekeepers, you want to uh, terrify peacekeepers in the UN and get them to withdraw uh, because no country wants body bags. No one. And so we have a major crisis with peacekeeping. We can't raise enough peacekeeping forces. Um, so these are some of the, the situations, the tectonic elements out there, if you like, uh, about the nature of conflict that we had to deal with uh, when you go on, uh, go on to the council. Um, overall, I should say the failures of the council are usually the failures which reflect the inherent contradiction between a body trying to um, seek to uh, develop consensus over peace and security, the inherent contradiction between that ambition plus the fact you've got five members uh, who are given a veto power and who have very different world views uh, and inherently are often going to uh, um, yeah, be at loggerheads or stalemate because of those different world views. Um, having said that, um, the agenda of the UN, the, of the Council, the Council agrees on most things. With all the difficulties and negotiations, particularly in Africa, and you may have to concede here and there in a resolution or a peacekeeping mission, but fundamentally there is a lot of agreement, uh, and it doesn't do too badly in a lot of areas. But where it fails, of course, it fails spectacularly. Syria is, now, you know, is a standout example of failure, um, and that's because of the inherent reason that I've just mentioned. Uh, I should welcome, by the way, Michael Bliss, who's just popped in. Uh, Michael was the political coordinator in our mission in New York, uh, responsible on a day-to-day -day basis for helping to manage, develop, and anticipate the Security Council agenda and everything associated with it. So, um, Australia. We uh, went on to the Council in the um, uh, 1st of January 2013 and went off at uh, one minute past midnight or whatever. Uh, in December 2014. Um, what did the world look like? Apart from all those tectonic uh, elements that I've outlined, we, we had conflict getting worse. We had, um, uh, uh, the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a major, major failing by the UN. Um, the Congo, a huge country and all the rest of it, very wealthy, but massive conflict, cyclical conflict, between something like... Um, 1995 and 2005, 2006, in that period of cyclical conflict in the DRC, six million people died. Now, that's a pretty big figure. Now, not all directly in combat, but as a result of conflict, six million. I mean, that's pretty bad. We had the largest peacekeeping mission in Africa was located in the DRC. You've got at least 50 rebel groups um, uh, acting and, 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 and all the rest of it um, and threatening stability and authority in the region and exploiting resources, a lot of them in particular along the borders with Rwanda in the eastern Congo, a place called the Kivus. Um, they occupied the regional capital, Goma. Now, this is a group called M23, uh, you know, really um, capable rebels. The importance of this particular incident was in occupying it, the UN peacekeepers did not resist sufficiently. They said because their mandate didn't allow them to, Women and children were killed in this process and all the rest of it, but the point was um, the UN mandate, uh, clearly we, the Council, found was a failure. We needed to do something about it. Quite an existential moment for the UN. And to summarise that, we moved and authorised combat operations. By the way, we said you've got to go out there and kill. The mandate said 
your mandate is, quote, to neutralise the armed forces, unquote. They did. They, they went and worked with the, uh, the Congo army and defeated the M23. They just have to take on everybody else. It's a more complex uh, picture. But anyway, we had that crisis on our hands. We'd had November 2012, the Gaza conflict, another. We had Syria, total gridlock and the situation getting totally out of control. We'd had another missile, ballistic missile launched by the DPRK against a whole series of UN uh, resolutions. We had the uncertainty about what was going to happen with Afghanistan with the transition of the NATO forces out at the end of 2014. And we had Al-Qaeda. This is before Daesh became uh, recognised and a preoccupation. It was a member of Al-Qaeda at that stage. Al-Qaeda subsequently expelled Daesh, of course, um, during 2013. We were the chair of the Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee, expelled Daesh because they thought they were too violent to keep them in the uh, membership of Al-Qaeda. So that alerted some of us to the fact that something might have been a bit crook. Anyway, Al-Qaeda was still out there, decentralised but not dead. Now, those trends only worsen significantly over our term. Um, when you look at the world at the end of our term, you have the following. We have less conflict if you add up all the individual conflicts around the world, but we have more simultaneous major conflict crises uh, across a, affecting a larger number of people, across a larger number of countries, across a larger swathe of the world than at any time since World War II. And you also have this uh, extraordinary range of humanitarian crises and the numbers of people affected. And not only around about 60 million people refugees or displaced, it keeps going up, uh, but another 120 million in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. And the humanitarian <coughs> system is failing. It's failing because there are too many crises, too many demands, and there's not enough money. The amount of money required, uh, we simply can't meet it. In the last 10 years, the amount required by the UN for humanitarian crises has gone up by 430%. Um, last year, it went up by 40% alone in one year, last year. So that's a measure of last year. And um, uh, it, it's simply impossible to manage all of that. So that's the situation. That, that really, we are at a point of potential unravelling and breaking points, so we have to take that into account very strongly uh, when we look at um, what our activities in the UN need to be, but as a global society. Um, the final factor, I'd say, facing us when we went on the Council was very, very high expectations. <coughs> um, when we were elected, we, um, we got 140 votes, uh, which was, I think, the official terminology was that that was an emphatic victory. Um, in my terms, any victory is emphatic, but, <laughs> but it was nice to have it described as an emphatic victory. So, you know, uh, 129 votes is what you need, two-thirds of the UN membership, which is 193. Now, only a few of us knew when we went into the vote that morning, into the room to cast the vote, that 40 countries, 4-0, had said, we can't vote for you, or won't vote for you. A lot of them said that because they were pre-committed to our two, there were two seats, as you know, um, <coughs> committed to our uh, two competitors, that's Finland and Luxembourg, because they'd done deals um, earlier on um, uh, before we entered the race. And God forbid, there are a couple of countries that actually don't like us. You know, so Syria was reluctant to commit, Venezuela was reluctant to commit, Egypt was reluctant to commit, uh, Algeria was reluctant to commit. North Korea and Iran both voted for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, they say, uh, but we think they did. Um, so we face the fact that you had 40 no's. <laughs> so when you take that off 193, you've only got, uh, what, 153 left to get the 129 you need to get elected. Now, UN voting is like all voting um, anywhere. You don't necessarily believe anybody who says yes, but you do believe those who say no. <laughs> so you take into account what is the pattern of what we delicately call the discount factor, um, which in fact I, I think one of my predecessors, the one who lost in the mid-90s, um, whoever that was, uh, called the RBL factor. Now it's, uh, I think, not a, not a great description in fact, because People sometimes have a reason. Uh, they're not going to say no. They don't want to say no for a whole series of political or cultural reasons. Certainly large groups of countries don't want to say no to a Western candidate because you're donors, and they don't want to say no to any um, potential donor. But anyway, whatever. The average for that is anywhere from 20 to 25% or even higher. Um, 
So that's pretty big. That's a quarter of the vote, maybe even higher. The year before we stood for election, Hungary was in a three-way contest with um, Slovenia and Azerbaijan. And they, their discount factor, the, no, the, the commitments which were not delivered in the first round, were 47%. And almost 90% of those were written. They were formal commitments by governments. They weren't oral. So uh, I didn't sleep well every night when these figures are sort of, instead of counting sheep, I'm kind of counting the no votes and so on. But if you take that 20 or 25 percent off the numbers you needed, we estimated that uh, we would probably, possibly get, you know, maybe at best 119 votes for the 129. So we had to come in second with a strong second so we could, um, you know, step, go into the, uh, the second round and hopefully uh, get across the... Uh, get across the line. In fact, we got 140 votes in the first round. Luxembourg had to go. Finland was disastrous, 107, um, although they told everybody they expected. 155 commitments, they said. Um, so they had a, something like 32% failure rate. Luxembourg, which eventually got up um, uh, in the second round, but with only um, uh, a smaller number, still less number of votes than we got in the first round. That was a matter of great pride. Um, they, uh, um, they had a failure rate on that of 18%. Our failure rate was 7%. Now, what does that mean? Apart from me, of course, and everything else, everybody <laughs> loving me. But leaving that aside, being serious, it meant the expectations of us, of course, were very high. Uh, we had almost complete support from the African group. There might be five, maybe six, but probably only five African countries uh, who didn't support us. Now, Bill Fisher was the envoy. Um, where are you, Bill? Sorry. Um, uh, to Francophone Africa and did absolutely brilliantly in, in all of that. There's uh, wonderfully. Uh, but we, we had uniquely, for a Western election, almost total support from the African group. Unheard of. So that was great. Why? Because they believed we would be an active member who would contribute well. But more than that, um, it helped frankly, that we were not an EU member. Uh, the politics and feelings at the UN at the moment, at that time, about the EU, our two uh, opponents were EU members, uh, were more in the negative side, and so it helped that we were from a different part of the world, but also with a strong record of performance in doing different things, particularly on humanitarian issues, and although our, our, our numbers of peacekeepers in UN terms was very small for UN peacekeeping <coughs> operations, we did have a large number of, of people in stabilisation missions and peacekeeping missions and so on uh, in other countries. Of course, this was during the period of high levels in Afghanistan. Um, East Timor, we'd just withdrawn, um, well, we withdrew at the end of 2012, um, uh, the last of our 500, you know, remaining 500 commitment there. And we had some in South Sudan who's still there and so on and so forth. So we had a good narrative of performance, but it was also um, the fact that we had a... Um, a clear agenda of things we said we wanted to do when we went on to the council and people were persuaded by that so expectations of us were extremely high. Now I'll have to um, start coming to an end so how do we assess ourselves and some of this can come out in questions. I think there are a, a number of assessments against which we should measure ourselves. Um, Prime Minister Gillard when we were elected said look uh, we need to look after our core interests now we're a member of the council. She said they were on the council, she defined those as Afghanistan. We had troops on the ground still, of course. Uh, Syria, because of the regional impact of the Syrian crisis, which was clearly getting out of control. Um, I should say, I mean, one in five people in Jordan are now Syrian. Um, almost 33% of Lebanon's population is now Syrian. Um, there are... 1.6 million Syrians living along the Turkish border in Turkey and you've got another 350,000 in Iraq and so on and so forth I mean this just gives you a measure and, and this is all increasing by the way there are 4 million Syrian refugees in all uh, we expect another 5 million maybe within the next 6 months not another 5 million, sorry to get to 5 million so the regional impact of all of that non-proliferation by which we mean uh, North Korea, Iran and any other uh, proliferation activity uh, and there was a desire articulated by the PM to reinforce our key strategic partnerships through uh, good performance on the Council. That's with the US, UK and whoever else. Um, well, I think 
if you measure the, the, that these are core interests, you measure ourselves against those we performed highly in all respects. We should also measure ourselves against the tasks the Council gave us. Um, we, uh, the Council is structured in the full Council and it has a series of subsidiary bodies. It has a body looking after each of the sanctions regimes and then other bodies, bodies on children and armed conflict, uh, counter-terrorism and, and women, peace, security, whatever and so on. Uh, we were given um, the largest number of tasks to look after and perhaps the most sensitive. We were made chairman of the Al-Qaeda Committee, chairman of the Taliban Committee, chairman of the Iran Sanctions Committee, uh, the pen holder, i.e. the coordinator on all matters related to Afghanistan, and we became the pen holder, the coordinator on Syria humanitarian. Um, and they were the tasks we were given. Now, of course, we did everything else, but they were the main thing. We had to deliver on those things as well, and I'll come back to that. Everybody has said uh, we did so uh, with a huge amount of success. The next measure you'd have to take into account is what we brought under our own initiative to the Council. And they, what we did at the beginning and prior to going on, but also on the Council, we identified gaps, what we thought were serious gaps, in the way in which the Council was dealing with its work or, or the issues they were looking at. And we brought those forward in our presidency of the Council. Now, we were fortunate to have two presidencies because of the alphabet. Um, so in September 2013 and November 2014, and you get, when you're president, you get the opportunity to bring one or two themes forward. Um, to try and advance them, you know, during your presidency. In September 2013, we brought forward a major debate on, um, on small arms. Uh, small arms are a major driver of conflict in the world, the illicit trade in them. We had the first, well, not the first debate on small arms, but a major debate on small arms. But we brought forward and got adopted a, uh, the first resolution from the Security Council on how to curb the illicit flows of small arms. That now becomes a key part of all UN mandates. Uh, our friends, um, unnamed, it's always your friends who are the warriors, of course. I'm obviously talking about UK, US and not France so much. Um, always raising problems with what you want to do. Of course, you're going to have disputes um, you know, with the Russians and Chinese in some way or another, although we worked um, uh, very cooperatively together on a lot as well. Um, but our friends said, oh, far too hard, you'll never get that up, you know, get resistance, it'll be vetoed, blah, blah, blah. So we persisted with it and we got it. Russia abstained, but because of a particular problem, they had one paragraph relating to counter-terrorism. Um, so we got that up and adopted, that was the first. Um, then in um, the following year, we, we identified the need for a debate on policing and its role in peacekeeping and a resolution which we brought forward and that's been quite an historic moment because it's never been debated before in the, in the Security Council in an articulated way, just policing and a resolution coming out of that which has provided us with the basis to expand policing participation in peacekeeping in the future. Now when you've got a situation where we can't raise enough peacekeepers, the hard edge peacekeepers, including for asymmetric and combat operations, think about it, um, the police are going to have to do a lot more backfilling a lot of the role to free up the smaller number of hard edge peacekeepers you're going to have in the mission, so very important. Uh, we also uh, put a huge amount of effort into reforming the sanction system, how it operates. I won't go through that in a huge amount of detail. Uh, it was a lot of original work, uh, work that hadn't been done for 10 years. Uh, the product of this, by the way, will be launched in New York in a publication next week. It will provide the basis for future reform of the sanction system. Ultimately, we were blocked by the Russians in bringing forward a resolution on that last November, but the work we did will be channeled uh, into a lot of other activities and sanctions in the UN, so it's useful to do. Um, they were the sort of key things we picked up on. Um, themes we pursued were protection of civilians. This was very important to us because we want mandates to define the primordial purpose of peacekeeping missions and so on is protection of civilians. If the UN can't protect civilians, what's it doing? It is the measure against we, which we will always be held. Huge focus on protection of civilians. We're not the only people thinking this, but we took a leadership role on all of that. Robust peacekeeping, combat. If you've got to kill, you've got to kill. Um, humanitarian, women, peace and security, rule of law and accountability, and human rights generally <coughs> as a precursor to conflict. A lot of resistance from the Russians and Chinese and some are having debates about human rights on the Council, but we push for them. Um, overall, our contribution, I think, has been pretty widely applauded. 
um, but other people will have to make that judgment. Uh, I won't uh, uh, tediously quote what others have said, but the one I like most is the most influential in three or four decades. That's not bad. Um, <coughs> and the French, <coughs> who said they were particularly uh, impressed, I think the word used on one occasion was dazzled, by the fact that we were prepared to take risk. For an elected member, they found that quite transfixing, but we weren't always sure where things would end up. But I have to say, an elected member, and also working with a couple of other elected members, we singled out uh, on Syria, for example, Luxembourg <coughs> and, um, and Jordan, <coughs> you can actually achieve results. I'll just mention one or two very quickly. Um, Afghanistan, the current resolution which, is being, uh, uh, which has the continuing post-NATO presence, although it's NATO and ourselves, we drafted and we did all the work on that uh, for last Christmas. Uh, Iran, um, uh, the sanctions regime which we helped tighten the implementation of it. I wouldn't overstate this, but we helped tighten the implementation. Very important at a time when the negotiations outside uh, the Council were happening uh, with the P5 plus one in order to show the Iranians the sanctions are still there and they're going to continue to operate and if anything they're going to get tighter <coughs> through the UN uh, to, to create an incentive to the negotiations. Terrorism, we did a lot of work on terrorism including last November we put forward an action plan to implement a couple of uh, resolutions against terrorism. Uh, Ukraine, MH17. Uh, this was a seminal moment for the Council um, and I don't have to rehearse all the elements of that, but the resolution which we drafted and had adopted uh, was one of the, one of the fastest um, uh, in UN history, possibly the, um, and it was quite a seminal historic moment for the Council in adopting this resolution. Our friends queried whether we should do it. Uh, the P3 said, don't do it. We said, well, we are doing it. And you know, the following day circulated the text, and then it was on a Friday, and then it was adopted. The following Monday, that met a direct interest of us, um, and we need to continue keeping a, a close eye on that. Finally, I'll say something about Syria very quickly. Time's yep, OK. So chemical weapons. Um, during our first presidency uh, in September 2013, you'd had chemical weapons uh, attacks um, by the Assad regime in Damascus. This transfixed and stopped everything that we were doing on the humanitarian efforts. We were trying to get a resolution on humanitarian relief up. We had to focus on chemical weapons. We were president. We came under a huge amount of pressure to have constant debate in the council about this. <coughs> we had to resist the pressure, including from friends, to say that is going to be of no use to anybody. We all know what positions are. We created space for the Americans and the Russians behind closed doors to do what needed to be done to create a resolution. We were not the originators or drafters of that, but we had to do the choreography to allow it to be adopted. And it has been a success. The first time ever a, um, uh, the elimination of a chemical weapons program ha has taken place. On the humanitarian side, I'd say only that the, we uh, managed to get three resolutions adopted last year. Um, increasingly focused on humanitarian access and some of the borders um, have been opened as a result of the last resolution, the last two resolutions, uh, against the will of Assad. Now, this has never happened in UN history. We've changed the paradigm of assistance across borders for humanitarian purposes in the UN. We haven't reached the number of people we want to, but it, uh, it's improving. And I'll finish in 60 seconds. What are the lessons? First lesson is be determined, don't lose your nerve. You can do what you want to do. Have a few partnerships with other elected members as well because that helps you do it. Secondly, you can do things that the P5 can't do because of their own gridlock. And if you write about it, they realise that at the end of the day as well, which is why the Russians and Chinese ultimately did not veto our resolutions on humanitarian relief in Syria. They couldn't have done it. They were pleased that it was done and it was as difficult as anything to get the negotiations done but at the end of the day they knew it had to be done. Um, it's what others do expect of us I have to say. Um, uh, one of the lessons they expect top performance from a country like Australia and we do need to live up to that. That brings me to the final point. Um, oh there's one deficiency by the way we did not do anywhere near enough with the Australian media so that anybody knew what we were doing in New York. 
you'll have to ask um, um, people above my uh, um, sort of civil service grade um, are the reasons why we didn't have as much access to the media as might have been desirable. I think Parliament's sitting at the moment. Um, so that's a lesson. The other lesson is we need to do a lot more in developing a constituency among the professionals in Australia who have an interest in UN matters. Although we did quite a lot, a lot more than uh, we thought. We should stand again, uh, and the government is, uh, we should stand regularly, uh, because everybody expects us to, and they want us to, and we should, I mean, for God's sake. And, um, and uh, people are looking at that uh, as we speak. Um, and it was fun. You agree, Michael? It was fun. Yeah. With hindsight, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so please, I'm sorry I did speak for too long, but questions and answers. Thank you very much. Questions, Gary, uh, anyway.